um, with Wayne State University School of Pharmacy. She is a professor of pharmacy practice uh, in her department. And we have the pleasure to also welcome um, uh, Dr. Nada Milhem uh, with the Faculty of Health Sciences of the American University of Beirut. Uh, Dr. Milhem is an Associate Professor of Infectious Diseases and Microbiology, and she is the Director uh, Division of Health Professions and the Chair Medical Laboratory Sciences Program. So welcome Dr. Milhem. And finally, we welcome um, uh, uh, Dr. Alina uh, in your burger, uh, with the CBS uh, care mark, and she is the senior medical director and medical affairs. Uh, welcome all to this important webinar. We have some challenging situation and some challenging questions. We hope that we will provide answers to both the professional and community members um, about COVID-19 and um, and vaccines. My first question is for Dr. Linda Jabber. Dr. Linda. Several polls had shown some degree of vaccine hesitance or lack of vaccine confidence among the US population. How would you, how would this hesitance and lack of confidence impact her herd immunity, which happens when the spread of virus is slowed due to widespread immunity? What are the myths or misconceptions responsible for the lack of vaccine confidence among some segments of our population? Dr. Linda? I was muted. So thank you, Dr. Adnan, uh, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, uh, Mona, uh, both Monas uh, very much, and Access for providing these timely programs. Um, you asked the key question, uh, a good question. Um, and uh, if, if I go too long, please stop me, um, because there's so many information um, that are available to us at this point. You asked first about the polls. Uh, the polls con conducted earlier this year, uh, I, I mean 2020, that's in spring or early summer, showed that about half of American adults were, um, were all willing to take the vaccine, only about half. So the other half were not at all willing. However, since then, there had been some sort of a steady increase in the rate of acceptance of the vaccine. More recent polls that's conducted by Gallup, the Kaiser Foundation, as well as the Pew Research uh, Center, all showed us that the percent of Americans willing to take the vaccine now went from 50% in the summer to 58% in October to 63% in November. We want 100%. And um, if you think about the increase in acceptance rates, there are several factors. One is the dire situation we're all in at this point. In the US alone, over 22 million cases of COVID, over 380,000 American uh, or, uh, dead. Even on a daily basis, we're averaging anywhere between 200,000 to 300,000 per, uh, per day. Uh, about two to three people die every day. Uh, in fact, uh, this pandemic had killed more Americans than one, the Vietnam War, uh, uh, the Vietnam War, the Korean War, and also World War I combined. Uh, so it is a devastating. So more people are, have now uh, a, a personal experience, um, uh, you know, or personally affected by the disease. Uh, second, people are mentally exhausted. Uh, they want a way out. They want to go back to normal living. And then the third factor, I think, is a forum like this one here and other public um, hearings and uh, media campaigns by medical authorities uh, to discuss the, uh, the data uh, for the safety as well as the efficacy of the vaccine, I think, help. You asked about uh, uh, vaccine resistance. Uh, these surveys also show that skepticism and resistance to vaccine is high among certain groups. Um, hesitancy is higher among minorities and immigrants um, um, compared to whites. Uh, hesitancy more among Republicans versus Democrats and among people living in the uh, rural areas versus those that live in, in cities. About one third of all of these 
people in these three groups uh, really are refusing completely to take the vaccine for several reasons. And I can talk about this if time per permits. Um, uh, about 40% or so are in the wait and see group meaning they want to wait until more people get fac vaccinated uh, in, in order to decide whether or not they should be vaccination. And the wait and see group is higher among African American Latinos um, um, compared to whites. Um, the surveys also asked about reasons for vaccine hesitancy. And the reasons for hesitancy also varied among these different groups. For example, among Blacks or African Americans, 70% of them are more worried about the side effects of these vaccines being a new uh, vaccine and done in a record speed. So that worries them. About 50% uh, believe that they can get COVID-19 from the vaccine. Again, all of these are myth and I can address all of them separately if you like. Uh, among Republicans, 57% surveyed um, um, do not believe that the risk of COVID-19 are there and that these risks are being exaggerated and about 25% of them do not want to get vaccinated because they do not believe that COVID-19 really poses a threat and they compare this to the flu. And I can, again, I can talk about differences between COVID-19 and the flu. Um, and and also some of the surveys ask about who are the people that you trust to give you information An overwhelming uh, majority, 85% of surveyed people uh, say that they trust their PCP the most. And however, they also trust uh, uh, the Centers for Disease and the CDC, um, they, they trust the local uh, departments and Dr. Fauci, yes. Um, thank you, Dr. Linda. This is very important insights about these social determinants of health um, factors related to vaccine. My next question is to Dr. Neuberger. Dr. Neuberger, can you explain the emergency use authority? If phase three trial have proven the efficacy and safety of both Pfizer and Madonna vaccines, why are these vaccines only authorized under emergency use authority? and not the full FDA approval or licenses. Dr. Neuberger? Um, well, I think this uh, question must have been, might be for Dr. Melham, but I can take it if, uh, if that's better. I think you, you can take it, and Dr. Melham can, uh, can elaborate if she, if she wishes to do so. And I like also to elaborate if possible on this question too. Okay. Okay, um, if I understand the question correctly, you would like to know why an emergency use authorization and not full FDA approval. Um, this um, uh, process that the FDA and the CDC are, are employing for these vaccines is completely different than anything we've seen before uh, because we've never before had to bring a vaccine to market in quite such a short time. Um, yeah, the um, poster child for um, uh, nim a nimble vaccine that was um, that had the shortest time to market had been four years, and now to get this done in one year is unheard of. Um, that is why a full label approval um, has not happened yet, because the FDA has these, um, you know, thresholds in place for. Uh, for them to be convinced of not only efficacy, which we are convinced of, but also two-year uh, a, a safety demonstrated by the two-year safety uh, two-year mark. So unless we've had a chance to follow these people for uh, the vaccine volunteers for a long period of time, um, we cannot say at this point uh, um, that this had had met the FDA level of approval. Now, most vaccines take years to develop, of course. Um, so people might wanna know how was this sped up? Why do we even have it, right? We shouldn't um, by, by this short time. Well, the, we had a head start. I would start by saying that. Uh, data from the SARS-CoV-1 and MERS-CoV coronavirus vaccine development saved time. And the initial step of the exploratory vaccine design was accelerated. Um, a second argument would be the government got involved early. They invoke, invoked um, emergency authority to enable manufacturing to start alongside clinical trials. Um, and manufacturing is usually 
built substantially after trials have concluded, but Operation Warp Speed has enabled manufacturers to de-risk and build manufacturing alongside clinical trials. Mm -hmm. um, then pandemic recruitment is a big one. The higher rates of infection from this virus and more trial participants have enabled manufacturers to recruit and demonstrate efficacy more quickly. And last but not least, cutting edge approaches. Um, new manufacturing technologies have helped accelerate vaccine production. Um, so a lot of uh, clinical um, inquiry and discovery has happened quickly. Government uh, contributed. So all these forces came together to bring us a vaccine in a record time and a very good vaccine, I may say. Um, did anyone else want to comment? Uh, yes, uh, the floor is open for both Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Jaber and Dr. Milh and Dr. Milham to elaborate on this issue because it is a source of the myths and the lack of positive attitude towards vaccines and the mistrust of the vaccine. We need to actually address this question very well. Dr. Milham, any elaboration from your side regarding emergency authority use and COVID? Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, actually, you know, Dr. Neuberger, uh, uh, like covered uh, the, the main and the most important uh, component of uh, the regulatory process of uh, the release uh, of a vaccine. And uh, uh, like it was mentioned, uh, we do have uh, a huge number of steps and the average of um, uh, number of years for the uh, for the development and uh, the the release of, of a vaccine uh, for for public use is actually 10 to 12 to 12 years and this is a, a record time um, now we do have a large number of these vaccines but it's uh, um, uh, 173 of them in preclinical development. We do have uh, uh, approximately 63 in clinical development, and we have the three runners up uh, the Pfizer, the Moderna, and the AstraZeneca from the University of Oxford. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, uh, the, the Pfizer and the Moderna uh, platforms, um, before I, I mention these, Many platforms, the classical platforms for vaccines have been and are being explored as we speak, but also innovative types of uh, methods um, uh, has, uh, you know, uh, have been uh, introduced. And uh, clearly the messenger RNA platform that Pfizer and uh, Moderna picked up uh, have been actually used uh, in different uh, uh, types of diseases, but they never had the chance to, uh, to, to be uh, actually developed. Uh, uh, we do have many messenger based uh, uh, types of vaccines that have been uh, studied in, in vitro or in, uh, um, at the cellular level and then at the animal level and in certain uh, cohorts, uh, cohort studies of specific groups uh, of uh, patients with cancers. Uh, uh, we do have studies as well uh, uh, among uh, HIV uh, in the HIV field and the simian immunodeficiency virus field. So, so these innovative technologies are extremely important and, and um, the advancement of the science has helped us uh, reach it. But, but also it's important to highlight the fact that the, the multidisciplinary approach and the uh, strategic type of thinking that was uh, moved forward during this pandemic has led us to this stage. And it also exposed a lot of the gaps and the flaws that we have uh, at all levels and that you know uh, many steps could be uh, uh, fast forwarded. Uh, the uh, one of the uh, parts of your question, Dr. Hamad, is uh, the fact that uh, because those vaccines have been uh, uh, developed uh, and uh, um, uh, approved under emergency use within a year, then this is a source of, uh, of hesitance and the source of lack of trust, which is absolutely correct. However, the, the, in order to alleviate the pandemic and in order to uh, reduce morbidity and in order to reduce mortality, in order to mitigate the severity of the disease and in order to, to also be able to reach a stage uh, by which we can relax the non-pharmaceutical interventions that we have been implementing um, uh, because, of the lacks, uh, because of the lack of therapeutics and um, 
vaccines, and I mean by those uh, specifically the public health uh, and social measures, uh, among uh, along with the other types of uh, contact tracing, the detection, and all of and the isolation measures, and the IPCs, and and uh, so thinking about uh, these types of uh, components and the efficacy that uh, what we have in front of us uh, from the advanced vaccines and uh, uh, that we have uh, would would help actually address uh, that hesitancy. However, an important component is to always have community engagement and, and uh, social listening. And in order to, to be able to, to uh, convince uh, communities uh, of uh, vaccines, because we've, we've, had, we've had this all along. I mean, the United States had reached the status of measles elimination in the early 2000s, but then it lost it uh, uh, because of importation uh, in 2017, 2018, and then people, the anti vaxxer movement was was also strong uh, strong and strong and so we need to bring communities and and listen about their perceptions uh, uh, in relation to vaccines you know involve them in the process involve them in the process of decision uh, making and uh, keep them updated and this is why if we learned anything in this during this pandemic is the need of the risk communication strategies along you know as as part of the uh, multidisciplinary approach uh, in addition to the uh, to the science of uh, of uh, the vaccines Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Melhem. Um, my question is to Dr. Linda Jaber. What are the current recommendations for vaccine administration in underrepresented groups such as pregnant, females, children, or those with allergies in phase three a trial for both the Pfizer and Madonna vaccines? Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Adnan. But um, I wanted just to add for the EUA, because I agree it was a major concern for some people that uh, these products, the Moderna and the Pfizer did not have full approval, is that I wanted to define the legal threshold for the FDA to grant EUA is that the product is effective. And second, that the benefits of the vaccine outweigh outweighs uh, the uh, risk based on data from at least one well-designed phase three trial uh, versus getting a biologics uh, license application, which only can be approved if the FDA determines there's substantial evidence of safety and effectiveness from multiple randomized controlled trial. And because people wanted to get the vaccine as quickly as possible, EAUA was the best way to do it. Um, and if we remember back in January of 2020, the Secretary of Health and Human Services uh, designated um, um, a public health uh, emergency related to COVID. And that allowed or justified the authorization of emergency use of several products or drugs that we use for the treatment of COVID-19, as well as the vaccine. And, um, and, and even though it is emergency use authorization, the FDA still had to analyze data from thousands of participants. And they found out there was compelling evidence for the safety as well as the effectiveness. So I wanted to make that point that even though the legal threshold is a little lower, but we have to have evidence of their safety and effectiveness. Um, uh, now, in terms if I, if of- If I may uh, add, oh, sorry. Sorry to interrupt. If I may uh, inject Dr. Jabber and uh, uh, the, the, the phases of, uh, um, of the, the trials that have happened, uh, of course, you know, the phase one and two that were lumped together uh, for these vaccines and the results from the phase three trials have, have led us to, to see that we have 94 to 95% of vaccine efficacy uh, among the uh, adult groups that were uh, in, the, in, the, in the clinical trials that have happened. And uh, to add to what Dr. Jabber has stated, we still have a long way to go, actually. We do have at least a year and more in order to determine whether uh, uh, we have determined the safety in, in those trials, we have determined the immunogenicity or the ability of these vaccines to induce uh, immune responses, uh, different branches of immune responses. Uh, uh, we have determined uh, uh, in, in these clinical trials uh, the, uh, the type of adverse events, but not the long-term adverse events that uh, uh, that are uh, 
uh, associated with these vaccines. So in the upcoming year and, and two to come, uh, we have to, do, to, to keep on monitoring the impact of these uh, vaccines in, in protect and their duration of protection, their ability to reduce severity of disease and their ability to stop transmission. And these we still do not have answers uh, for. And this is why uh, 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 we still have a long way to go. Okay, thank you, Dr. Malhem. Dr. Jaber, are you satisfied yeah. with your or you wanna continue and answer that question? Yeah, uh, I just wanted to add that I agree with that, but see the sponsors for Moderna and Pfizer, for example, were planning a, there are uh, planning two year study and therefore there's keep, uh, you know, uh, in, in their ongoing trials, um, collect data on the safety and uh, of the vaccine, as well as the effectiveness uh, long-term, as well as the uh, disease trans transmission. Even though we do have some promising uh, numbers at this point about disease transmission, um, I can, we can talk specifically about the two main phase three trials. Mm -hmm. And I agree, there are still gaps of, of knowledge. However, the studies are ongoing. Uh, we expect that in an, that it will take several more months before these sponsors of Pfizer and Moderna uh, go to the FDA back for a full, uh, uh, full um, license and approval. But if you wanna talk about things we're missing, uh, we can do that. But I also wanted to address the question on um, what are the current recommendation uh, by the CDC and the FDA for uh, some groups of patients that were either underrepresented in these phase three st studies or completely excluded. So I'll start with children and adolescents. Uh, we know that uh, uh, for children and adolescents less than 16, um, uh, they're not authorized to receive Pfizer and less than 18, not authorized to receive uh, Moderna uh, because these people were not included in the phase three study. However, there is a bridging study that uh, I believe had begun in January in the US to make sure that uh, the COVID-19 vaccine efficacy as well as safety parameters are comparable to those obtained in the adult. And the bridging study, the beauty of that is you do not need to recruit thousands and thousands of patients. You probably can end up with maybe 2,000 to 3,000 uh, kids. Um, and if the results are comparable to those seen in the adults, then uh, that would be enough proof. So children and adolescents is still excluded. The second big part are the uh, pregnant and breastfeeding women. Those mm -hmm. were excluded from the main uh, studies. However, even though we do not have data on it, the, the CDC recommends that these women may choose to vaccinate, again, based on a discussion of risk to benefit ratio, um, and, and they recommend discussion with PCP. And the reason for that is we, we do not have evidence at this point that the vaccines will have adverse effects on pregnant or breastfeeding. And we, but we also know uh, that pregnant uh, women with COVID-19 have increased risk of severe illness, including uh, admission to the ICU, mechanical ventilation, and even um, uh, there had been reported some adverse uh, uh, pregnancy outcomes, such as preterm um, uh, birth. Uh, the third group of people is uh, people with underlying chronic diseases. Uh, both phase three clinical st studies have included people with diabetes, for example, which is a huge risk factor for severe complications. Uh, people that obesity, both of these trials, about 30% of the patients were in the overweight obese because obesity, again, is a major risk factor. Uh, some of the patients had cardiac disease. The problem is uh, still the numbers of people with chronic disease was a little low. However, we know that these people have increased risk of severe complications and therefore the CDC recommend then they should be vaccinated. In fact, they have priority. Uh, the third uh, or fourth group of people are the immunocompromised. Again, we don't have enough data or conclusive data as the effectiveness or the safety of these vaccines on the immunocompromised. However, the recommendation is 
uh, they should get vaccinated unless there is a contraindication. However, we all have to keep in mind, and patients have been to be told that um, the uh, that these patients may have a weaker immune response. Remember, they have weakened immune system, and therefore they might end up with a weaker immune response to the vaccines. Um, another group of people are those with a current or a prior history of COVID-19 infection of SARS. CoV-2. The recommendation is people with a history of COVID-19, the recommendation is to vaccinate regardless of the prior infection, because now we're seeing more case reports of reinfection. And there's so much data now to sort through. For example, just last week, a study from Wuhan uh, showed that um, uh, people infected early in January to, to May of 2020, um, and they were followed up with serological testing that these people, um, um, most of them, uh, over 50% of them have weaker immune uh, response or uh, uh, less neutralizing antibodies. So the possibility of reinfection uh, remains there. Um, so, but for those with a, a Current COVID-19 recommendation is you have to wait until they recover completely. And even they go further that people normally that have COVID illness, they have some sort of a protection for about 90 days. So if you delay their vaccination 90 days after the infection, that would, that would be okay too. But the bottom line, uh, these groups also can vaccinate unless they have contraindication. Thank you, Dr. Jabber. Um, uh, a couple more people, but we can talk about them later. That is the, our speakers, could you please restrict your answers to three minutes? Because we have a lot of questions that we need to ask, and I just wanted our audiences, both the professional and community, to have the best answers to, uh, to vaccines with the hope that we can give them uh, this feedback that would encourage them to be vaccinated. My next question to Dr. Alena, in your burger, um, and the one after is to Dr. Melhem. Uh, Dr. Elena, regarding the vaccine distribution, uh, what is the order of priority for those who can receive the vaccine? What is the vaccination process for the different parts of our population, including healthcare workers, senior citizens, and those with the pre-existing conditions? This is a relevant question to Dr. Jab, is a question that she elaborated on a little earlier, but we need to make sure that we have answers to this question. Dr. Neuberger? Definitely. This is a great segue from Dr. Jabber's um, uh, statements. Um, so uh, we at CVS Health are mobilizing to provide vaccine access for all Americans consistent to the federal and state prioritization guidelines. Um, and as we know, the federal government through the Operation Warp Speed has bought all the active ingredient vaccines and is making it available to states in a stepwise manner. Phase one, um, there, in phase one, there are two essential pathways to access that will likely evolve with a transition to the new administration later in January. But phase 1A includes healthcare practitioners via federal, direct federal allocation to states, according to the number of their provider population. Um, states will distribute to their health systems, who in turn will distribute to their healthcare workers. And this should flow in two essential workers in phase 1B. Uh, the long-term care program is done through um, something called Pharmacy Partnership for Long-Term Care, which is a memorandum of understanding where we and Walgreens were selected and individual long-term facilities designated one of us to come and immunize their, uh, their um, population, patient population and workers. Uh, the key here is that the direct allocation is from the feds, not the states to, to support long-term care. Um, phase 1B is to include those 75 years old and older and certain frontline essential workers who cannot work remotely and have high levels of interaction with the public. And those include uh, police officers, firefighters, food workers, public transit, postal workers, and, and so on. And these two cohorts are estimated to amount to about 50 million people. Um, phase 1C uh, was initially delineated by the ACIP um, to consist of people 65 to 74 and those under 64 with high risk medical conditions, anywhere from obesity, diabetes, heart conditions, chronic kidney disease, 
cancer, sickle cell, uh, history of smoking even, and these are about 130 million. million. Uh, recently, uh, just yesterday actually, the CDC expanded the COVID vaccination guidelines to, um, to these two other phases uh, as phase one is approaching full coverage and phase B is underway. So um, think, of, think of it um, as uh, the way you onboard a plane. Um, it's not necessary one group to be fully onboarded prior to the second group starting. So we'll see a lot more expansion here, uh, which I'm very excited about. So states are actively working to finalize these uh, prioritization guidance for critical infrastructure workers. Um, and, and we're well positioned to support. Uh, we anticipate the vaccination of these workers to begin soon in many states. And uh, we are in discussions with these authorities uh, about supporting these efforts and we'll communicate further specifics as they become available. Uh, because of the complexity of attestation, um, it, will, it looks like it, it will be a self-attestation, meaning I walk up to the pharmacy and I um, you know, share that I am a teacher or whatever my profession might be, and I don't have to show um, any proof because that would create more bottlenecking. How about general population? Something uh, that's on everyone's mind. Uh, for the general population, there is something called Federal Pharmacy Partnership Strategy. And this is where the government identified retail pharmacies to get allocation directly from the government to use at retail and vaccinate the population. And this will really lead to expanded access. We anticipate it to be in Q2, uh, second quarter, or as early as late Q1. This is constantly changing. And it could open earlier with a transition to the new administration with the role of retail pharmacies moving up in the process. Uh, but right now we await further guidance. With more than 70% Americans living within five miles of a CVS location, hopefully that will expand access and our total vaccine capacity will be about 20 to 25 million a month. And I'll stop here in the interest of time. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Milhem, my, my next question is for Dr. Milhem. And then, um... Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We yeah, just can see you at the Dr. moment. Milhem. Yeah, Dr. Milhem, uh, myths and perceptions of vaccines in the MENA region and around the globe uh, are being faced with some serious challenges. Could you kindly give us a brief update on COVID-19 vaccine and current situation in the MENA region and around the globe? The, the perceptions and the challenges uh, uh, that I have mentioned earlier and that uh, Dr. Jabal uh, has mentioned are the same in the Eastern Mediterranean region in general and in Lebanon specifically. Uh, now, in terms of uh, the access of, uh, to vaccines in the Eastern Mediterranean region, uh, currently, you know, um, not many of, of these countries uh, uh, have started the vaccination. Uh, we have a uh, few countries in the Arabian Peninsula that started um, using the Pfizer as well as other types of vaccines. In Lebanon, we have registered, the, the Ministry of Public Health has registered the, uh, the Pfizer vaccine and is currently drafting uh, uh, a project law in order to um, uh, start uh, the vaccine rollout uh, uh, by uh, hopefully mid-February. Uh, mid and this is uh, taking place uh, uh, also under the patronage of the, uh, and the supervision of the Ministry of Public Health uh, and then followed by the uh, health committee at the uh, parliament uh, in order to to approve the emergency use uh, of um, uh, this vaccine in, in Lebanon and this is being expedited actually uh, so so those perceptions and uh, and the challenges and the barriers that we have mentioned are are all the same it is important to know that the ACT accelerator or the COVAX under the WHO is uh, going to be an important uh, component in sponsoring and procuring vaccines uh, to the eastern Mediterranean region and uh, of course the most important part uh, 
which is which you know which is a compilation of what we have been uh, stating is the readiness of different countries whether a an, an EMR country or an eastern mediterranean region or a european country or uh, an, uh, an american uh, uh, or any type of uh, of country on the globe and the assessment of readiness in terms of logistics in terms uh, logistics of deployment in terms of logistics of uh, storage in terms of lo uh, of logistics of um, uh, use and distribution and equitable distribution, which is an important component, especially in low and middle income countries uh, uh, that are uh, many of which are members of the Eastern Mediterranean region. And many countries are in conflict and, uh, you know, a high number of displaced populations. So these are all challenges that every nation is haunted, actually, uh, uh, by, uh, by the to to uh, and communicate about the effectiveness. Yeah, Dr. Mayhem, we are accelerating. We are losing you. you. Hear me now? We are losing you. Are you close to an internet, uh, um, you know, location? We are losing you. Can you hear me now? Can yeah. You hear you? Um, I can't, we can hear you, but with some interruption. We will get back to you, Dr. Melhem, uh, and please just examine uh, the internet situation in your surroundings. My next question is for the three speakers. Is COVID-19 testing is still an important part of our community response? What impact does testing have on our own health and the health of our community? I need answers from the three speakers. Dr. Newberg, Definitely, I think uh, I think testing cannot uh, has never been more important than it is now. As we know, it's a tool to to limit spread and transmission. If you don't know you're infected, you don't know to protect yourself and the others. And of course, we should all respect uh, things like social distancing, masking, and the other uh, guidance uh, pieces that were communicated to us by, by our public health experts. Uh, but uh, testing um, access to testing is extremely important, even in this uh, stage of the pandemic when will soon have a vaccine. Um, we at CVS have launched it early in, in last spring. Now we're in phase three, where uh, we have about um, 4,700 test sites in 33 states, nearly 1,000 a week, which pr provide a, a rapid result. Some are minute clinic based, others are delivered in kiosks with separate entrance for patient isolation, which is critical. And we also offer appointments. Uh, so walking, uh, waiting inside a store is minimized. Uh, we use the plexiglass partition as you know, and this combined with a drive-through swab and send makes up for about 70% of the na national retail testing. So testing will become will stay important, will remain important until we achieve that herd immunity, right? Because of uh, based on what other speakers have said, we don't know exactly how much the vaccines are protective against asymptomatic transmission. Um, and until then, and until everyone is vaccinated, uh, outbreaks will still occur. Um, also, I, I wanted to mention that um, speaking of vulnerable communities, um, nearly 60% of our 4,000 drive-throughs are uh, serve communities with demonstrated need for support as measured by the CDC Social Vulnerability Index. Um, we partner with national organizations such as National Medical Association, local community groups, um, and we also have 14 community mobile si test sites that are located at the facilities of our partner organizations, enabling those who need testing the most to just walk up uh, and get it. There's no vehicle uh, required for drive-through, there's no appointment required, uh, testing is completely free, uh, and these individuals can, um, uh, can, can uh, be tested. Um, I'll uh, pass it off to my other speakers uh, to see if anyone wants to add anything. Dr. Jabber, any elaboration on that? Yes, uh, yes. That I, I agree um, with what was said. Uh, testing will remain an important part, and in the U.S., we're not 
as good at uh, viral uh, surveillance as in other countries, for example, the, the UK. And a given example is the new strain that was identified that's now known as the B117 that was first identified in the UK. Uh, we believe that this uh, uh, um, mutated uh, COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2 had been in the US all along, but we do not know uh, do as many testing. Testing remains important because we know that about 40% of those infected never had any symptoms and therefore they do not know they have the disease. And those are the people that are normally spreading uh, the infection to non-infected uh, people. The other things uh, why testing is important, we know that the official numbers is that over 22 million have reported cases of COVID-19. Uh, a lot of statistical uh, uh, modeling uh, studies have showed that you have to multiply this by five times. So the, the, the it's not 22. You're talking about maybe uh, 80 million or 100 million. And, and the reason for that is because we're not doing enough uh, testing. But I, what I wanted also to say is that to get vaccinated, the CDC does not require that people get tested prior to vaccination. Uh, so that's not a requirement to receive the vaccine. Okay, I'm going to take one. Uh, we have so many questions from the audience and I'm going to take just a couple of them, please. Um, the first one, which I think it is important uh, for, 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 the, for, the three of, uh, for the three of you to answer. There were several cases of Bill's policy reported it during the clinical trials. The conclusion was that these were not likely associated with the vaccine. I was wondering, the, the, the person who's asking the question is saying, I was wondering if there have been any occurrences since the vaccination process as it started. As someone who had Bill's epilepsy three years ago and to date have not fully recovered, I am concerned about the recurrence. Should, be con should I be concerned about getting the vaccine? I am 68 years old, so I am in a, high, in a higher risk group and should seriously be considering the vaccine. Um, if I can start just because I have the Please CDC do. recommendation. Please do briefly because we have other yes. questions. Yeah, to there are cases of Bell's policy exactly reported uh, with the vaccination for both the Moderna as well as the Pfizer. Uh, like you said, the FDA does not, did not consider this above the, uh, the expected uh, rate for the general population. However, they're still looking at that. Uh, what I wanted to say that all these cases, the Bell's um, um, policy had been resolved, reversed, reversed. Um, however, a person with a uh, history of Bell's uh, 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 policy, is um, at this time, they're saying that you can vaccinate, you can, you can vaccinate. So the recommendation by the CDC that even if you do have a Bell's uh, policy that you can still go for vaccination. Uh, Dr. Inyoberg, any remarks on this question or additions? Uh, yes, I'd like to say, uh, that, that was very good, I agree with Dr. Javert. I'd like to say that um, a Bell's palsy is a condition that's fairly um, not, well, uh, not well described and understood, and it can also be caused by a lot of viral and bacterial pathogens. So um, while I'm not sure a lot of data is available about how often uh, you get Bell Bell's palsy from COVID itself, I think there's reason to believe that you might because uh, so many other viruses can cause it. So I would think of it that way. I mean, you could get Bell Bell's palsy from from the COVID together with a lot of other things um, as a higher chance than, than getting it from the vaccine. That's just my take on it. Uh, another question, uh, Dr. Milham, any elaboration or should I just go ahead and ask more questions? Uh, actually, uh, no, thank you very much. It was well covered, but I would like to uh, shed a little bit of light on uh, the uh, testing issue in different countries, uh, uh, you know, uh, post the era of vaccination. 
I mean, uh, it is very important specifically because of the emergence of a new variants uh, starting, I mean, we, of, of SARS-CoV-2, and this started in, uh, in January, February of 2020, the D614G, uh, and then uh, we have seen another cluster in Denmark, uh, uh, and then in uh, December uh, of uh, uh, this past of 2020, the UK variant or the variant of concern that we have seen and that was uh, detected in Northern Ireland as well as in South Africa. And then later on, uh, we have, uh, and the, as of last week, we have a new variant um, in Japan that was detected. Um, among uh, uh, travelers coming back from Brazil. And uh, uh, the importance of testing as well as genomic sequencing uh, continuously is an important component of epidemiologic, of, of epidemiologic surveillance as well as, uh, as uh, genomic surveillance. And uh, um, it is, of course, uh, important to realize that many low and middle income countries do not have the platforms and the facilities to do so. But we do need to invest in these uh, types of platforms in order to be able to monitor the emergence of these variants and mutants because they, until now, they do not have any impact so far, which is, so, which is good. They do not have any impact on, uh, on vaccines or, or resistance to vaccine. But uh, SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus. It mutated. It is going to continue to mutate and exert selective pressure on the immune system. And consequently, we would always have to uh, monitor trends in emergence through testing and, and uh, surveillance. Thank you, Dr. Milham. Uh, a question from the audience, would the vaccine prevent, prevent me from getting COVID once I get it? Um, Dr. Newberg, could you please answer this question for the audience? Yes, uh, for the Pfizer and Moderna, they really the, the tri clinical trials looked at severe disease. So we can answer an emphatic yes to will uh, the vaccine uh, prevent me from um, developing severe COVID disease, uh, landing in the hospital, um, you know, having my life in danger. That's absolutely yes. 95% is really as confident as we can be. As far as um, mild disease or asymptomatic disease, the data is not quite there yet. Um, Pfizer did not uh, test uh, participants um, consistently to see uh, to check for asymptomatic uh, infections. Moderna tested them once when they presented for their second shots, and they shots and they did find that about two to three times more patients de developed asymptomatic disease in the uh, placebo arm than in the active arm. So there's some level of confidence there that it also pr uh, prevents mild and asymptomatic disease. Other manufacturers coming to market, AstraZeneca specifically, has swabbed volunteers consistently. So when that comes out, we will know if that vaccine prevents any sort of disease. But in the beginning of the pandemic, of paramount importance is severe disease, as I'm sure we all agree, uh, the danger of being in the hospital or um, of having uh, long-term effects and having our life in danger. Thank you. Uh, my next question from the audience to Dr. Jabber. Dr. Jabber, how does an mRNA vaccine work and what other mRNA vaccines exist? Dr. Jabber? I was muted again. Okay, that's a very important question because part of the concern in the public is about the, the new technology. Yes. So five points I wanna highlight. And then if we give me more time, I can explain a little bit more. One is the COVID-19 MRI and a vaccine had been rigorously tested for safety uh, before, before being authorized. So I want that this to be uh, clear. Second, the MRI technology is new in the world of vaccination. However, it's not uh, completely new and people have worked on that for decades. And I'll give you examples um, like early stage clinical disease using MRI and a vaccines had been carried out for influenza, for Zika, for CMV. Um, and also it had been tested 
um, um, for um, uh, in the cancer uh, uh, as a cancer antigen to stimulate immune response to reduce malignant tumors. So even though it's new to us as a vaccine vehicle or technology, it's not new to science. Uh, third point is that it does not carry or contain a live virus and therefore does not carry the risk of causing a disease, unlike uh, the traditional way of vaccine development, which use either live disease, live virus, or a weakened virus, or it, a attenuated virus. Uh, third, the fourth point is that the mRNA vaccine never enters the nucleus of the cell. That had been a really like very rampant in the community, talking about that this vaccine will change your genetic. The, the mRNA never enters the nucleus of the cell and therefore does not affect at all the person's DNA. Um, in the, um, and also what now we're seeing is that the mRNA technology has the potential to really change um, the future vaccines because you can use that technology to target multiple diseases, not just one disease. Um, in terms, what I also wanted to uh, just explain what this means, the mRNA vaccine, meaning that the, uh, the genetic um, the instruction for building the spike protein. Now, remember, coronavirus uh, is studded with proteins on its surface. And these spike proteins are so important because they allow the coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2, to actually bind to receptors uh, first in the lungs, these receptors are the ACE2 receptors. And so it's a critical when the spike protein interacts with these receptors and therefore enters the cell and also critical step in viral replication. And, and therefore many of the vaccines that we are seeing, Moderna, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, they're really using the spike protein as the target. In the mRNA vaccine itself, the mRNA contains instructions to the cell to make part of the spike protein. So the cells are not even making the entire spike protein, making parts of the cell. And the body is going to look at this as a, a foreign antigen, a foreign pathogen, and build uh, T cell immunity and antibodies against it. Once that RNA give the instructions, the body really destroys, destroys, break down the mRNA and are uh, uh, removed. Because mm -hmm. many people thinking, well, it's an mRNA material. It's a genetic material. It will change our DNA. That's not the case. Um, if you, you want to give me more time, we can elaborate more no. on the technology itself more time. I have one more question that I need to ask Dr. Renew Berger with the hope that she can answer this question in two minutes and then I will wrap up uh, this webinar. Dr. Elena, uh, a lot has been said uh, about SARS-CoV-2. Could you please shed some light on this issue? Oh, could you be more uh, specific uh, in, in what way? Can you comment on the new strain of SARS-CoV-2? Got it, a new strain. Sorry, you cut, uh, cut it a little bit. Yeah, all viruses mutate. Um, SARS-CoV-2 seems to mutate slower than the most, about half as much as influenza. An average is about one mutation every two weeks per a United Kingdom committee that is tracking this. And the important thing is every time it mutates, it's a single mutation. It's a point mutation, uh, either a couple of nucleotides or, um, you know, of the, of the genetic material or a couple of amino acids if it's the protein antigen that mutates. So it's not, a, you know, of course, it impacts the disease negatively, it's more transmissible. That's why viruses mutate to adapt to their environment better. But in terms of vaccines, both uh, Pfizer and Moderna do not target that piece of, of it, so um, they should be effective. Same goes for the testing we have. All the tests that we've looked at still identify disease despite these mutations. Um, the good thing about it is that the messenger RNAs manufacturers can redesign these vaccines in as little as six weeks 
Um, so if the virus were to mutate in the future at a, in a point of the spike protein, that is um, the one that these vaccines target, um, they can quickly pivot and, and create new vaccine that would be effective. Um, in terms of, um, so we have also a reassuring um, a fa a fact, the fact that the known mutation of G614, it's an older last year, has been extensively studied. So we know it, that strongly suggests that the uh, all the other vaccines in development, AstraZeneca, j, &J are unlikely to be uh, affected by the new mutation. Um, the newest strain, the UK, harbors about 23 mutations. So it's a little bit of a sprint forward from the virus. But again, below what we expect for influenza. We have yearly vaccines for influenza and we're able to, to quickly redesign and, and stay ahead of the virus. So whatever's happened so far, so far, um, you know, reassures me that that would be the case moving forward. So I don't expect major, major changes either in the virus or um, in its pattern of mutation that would inactivate our response to it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nunez Burke. Uh, to our wonderful audience, and I'm sorry that I could not, um, you know, accommodate all your questions. There is uh, still a dozen or so uh, questions that have been placed on this webinar. It is my sincere uh, wish that our esteemed speakers will be able to answer some of these questions when Access Communications would relay these questions to, to you directly. Uh, our audience are very important um, element of these webinars. Thank you to each uh, of our panelists for taking the time to discuss this important topic. And thank you to everyone who tuned into this uh, conversation. Thank you to Access Leadership in addressing um, COVID-19 and vaccine among other issues. Our next webinar will take place in February and we'll be addressing, and we'll be addressing COVID-19 and refugee populations in the state of Michigan, uh, USA, and around the globe. We hope to see you then um, next month. Thank you all.